Hi everybody, welcome to your first full virtual lab. Uh, this will be lab six, which will focus on non-enzymatic browning, um, specifically the Maillard reaction. There are two major types of browning uh, that we study in food science, and those two main categories are enzymatic browning and non-enzymatic browning. So we've already looked at enzymatic browning this semester, uh, and that's generally the browning caused by enzymatic actions such as polyphenol oxidase, um, which we observed in our potato and apple lab. Um, and now we're going to focus on non-enzymatic browning, which can be broken down into three different types of non-enzymatic browning. Uh, the first is Meyer browning. This is uh, the result of the reaction between an amine group and a reducing sugar um, in the presence of heat. And it's common browning seen uh, in baked goods or fried goods. Uh, we also have caramelization, which is the browning of sugars at high temperatures. Uh, and this is in the absence of those amine groups. And then we also have lipid browning. So this is uh, browning caused by polymerization of lipids after prolonged heating. You'll commonly see this if uh, you're using a frying oil for a long time, or maybe you uh, grease a baking sheet and cook it at a really long high temperature, you'll find this brown kind of uh, sticky polymerized oil on that surface over time. Like I said, uh, we're focusing on the Meyer browning in this lab. Uh, and this is a common reaction reserved, uh, observed in many cooked or baked foods. Uh, such as like the browning of bread and cookies, uh, malted barley. So if you're malting barley to make beer, you'll see this kind of browning, and that imparts the brown color in your beer once you use those malts. It's also seen in potato chips and fries. It imparts desirable flavors and aromas, those that we associate with those baked goods or those fried goods, um, and it's generally a desirable attribute. Occasionally, uh, Meyer browning can generate some toxic compounds, and they're generally low amounts. One notable uh, toxin is acrylamide. You might have heard of this. This uh, occurs when asparagine is the amino acid that reacts with the reducing sugar, and this is a pretty potent neurotoxin and is actually found in uh, a lot of fried foods, especially things like potato chips and fries but it's in incredibly low levels to the point where you would die from the amount of potato chips or fries you'd have to eat before you'd uh, be exposed to those toxic levels. But it's still kind of interesting to know that because a lot of people will say that, oh, these toxins are produced in these foods, um, but they don't even approach the levels uh, to cause that acute toxicity. Here we have the reaction, uh, just a general reaction of this reaction between uh, reducing sugar and amine that causes our uh, brown products as well as Strecker aldehydes, which are associated with the aromas in my browning. There's a number of factors that can impact the rate of reaction of the Meyer browning. Um, and the first of those are the reactants. So uh, the concentrations of our amine sources and our reducing sugars will impact the uh, rate of this reaction. So if we have more of those, generally expect a faster reaction. Uh, as well as the identity of these reactants can affect that uh, rate. So um, especially for our amine source, if we have something like lysine, that tends to react uh, much faster than other amino acids to form uh, Maillard products. Temperature impacts uh, Maillard browning. So generally, the lower temperature we have, the slower this uh, reaction progresses. pH uh, is also an impact. Uh, is also a factor that impacts Meyer browning. So generally, the higher the pH, the more browning that occurs, or the faster that browning occurs, with optimum pHs ranging from 8 to 10. Uh, when we have something like sucrose, as I said, uh, we need to have that acid hydrolysis of sucrose in order to get our reducing sugars. So in that case, uh, adding some acid actually increases the rate, uh, the rate of acid hydrolysis, which may lead to uh, an appearance of faster browning. And that's just because we have to go through that extra step of acid hydrolysis to get our fructose and our glucose, um, which are reducing sugars. So in that case, uh, a slightly more acidic environment may lead to faster mired browning. But in general, if we have reducing sugars and amine uh, groups already present, a higher pH leads to faster browning. Lastly, sulfite uh, can inhibit the formation of our brown colors. Uh, what happens is it's a nucleophilic attack of our aldehyde 
uh, and are reducing sugar. So um, you can see it in this reaction here, uh, once that uh, a nucleophilic attack happens at the aldehyde spot, uh, we can no longer continue down our reaction uh, to form our brown products and our striker aldehyde, so that inhibits our Meyer browning. Today's lab, we're going to focus on uh, the impact of glucose concentration on the extent of Meyer browning. So what we'll be doing is taking a series of different test tubes and adding uh, different concentrations of glucose solutions ranging from a control which is just water from 1%, 2%, 3%, up to 10% glucose solution. And then we'll be adding egg white in the form of an egg white powder. And we'll be heating those together um, over time to see how that impacts the color. So we'll add our egg solution and our glucose together. We'll heat that in a boiling water bath for an hour and then we'll measure the absorbance at 420 nanometers to see how much of that brown color is developed and is that color dependent on our concentration of glucose. So some things to consider uh, while you're watching this video. Uh, essentially, just imagine you're doing this lab. You'll be watching me do it um, and it'll be sped up so you don't have to spend three hours in lab, but kind of think about each step that we're going through. Um, as if you were doing them and, and thinking about what factors impact the brown color development in this lab. So we have our different treatments. How do you expect um, browning to change across those treatments? So as we increase glucose solutions, do you think browning is going to go up, down, stay the same, uh, and why? Uh, generally, how, how could you change a food system to modulate Meyer browning? Let's say you really want to emphasize it in one food product. What could you do? either in your processing or your, in your formulation to maximize that Meyer browning, or if you're in the opposite application, you want to minimize that Meyer browning. Um, again, what processing or ingredient formulations could you change in order to minimize that? Also, I want you to think about how you would expect aroma to change as browning progresses. So as we have more browning, how would you expect uh, the associated Maillard aromas to change in this reaction? Um, you can think about baked goods, like the longer I bake them, do they smell um, more of these pleasant aromas or am I starting to get off aromas? What, what do you think happens as this uh, reaction progresses? Um, you won't have the chance to smell any of these samples. Uh, that might be fortunate for you because some of them smell just like rotten eggs. Uh, but just kind of use your experience as you've done baking in your past um, or you've just seen a lot of different foods that have this Meyer browning and how you expect this aroma to associate with the browning. And as always, um, think about what the research question is in this lab. Why are we doing this? Why is it important to food scientists? And look for possible sources of error in this lab. So I'm doing this and you're going to pretend that you're doing this as well. What, what's bringing error into uh, this process and how is that going to impact our results? For your lab report, you're going to use the data provided on Canvas. So this is the data I collected, um, as well as your other TAs. And you'll just pretend this is your own data, as well as everybody else's in your lab, and combine that all and use it to complete your report. You need to address your discussion questions in your report uh, and in your lab notebook. So just treat this like a regular lab. You have some pre-lab questions. So think about those before you watch um, the lab activity and kind of think about what you expect to see as you go through this lab or as I go through this lab. And when you get a chance, add those to your lab notebook. So we still want to have you go through the practice of reporting in your lab notebook. Looking at the report um, or the outline, you'll need to summarize your data in the tables appropriately and provide those sample calculations. So every time you're doing a standard deviation or a percent ZV, you need to give a sample calculation. And then we're going to plot uh, our absorbance data. So we're looking at the absorbance of our different solutions and replicates uh, and seeing is there any sort of linear relationship there. So you'll be plotting that data, um, standard deviations, and giving a linear trend line. And make sure you discuss the implications of your findings. So if there is a linear relationship, what does that mean? Um, about our concentrations of reactants and what they and how they impact the Meyer-Browning reaction. 
And then you want to do your overall discussion. So this overall discussion, just one paragraph will be those pre-lab discussion questions. Um, something that's commonly missed, people are just doing pre-lab discussion questions as your full discussion, but those are separate. We also want you to look at um, and just talk about your overall results of the lab, um, how you would evaluate accuracy and precision for this lab, what sources of errors might be, um, and just general implications of this lab. So you want to kind of pull everything together that you've learned from the lab, um, from reading the report, reading any extra literature, and watching the lab performed, as well as your at-home activity that you might do. And then you want to answer the questions um, that are in the handout. We're providing an at-home bonus activity. Uh, this is optional, but it will give you two additional lab points, which would be awesome um, and really kind of help your grade in the course. And it, it should really um, be a great bonus since we're all kind of stuck at home. We give you a, a chance to do some hands-on food science uh, in your kitchen. And we're trying to use ingredients that hopefully everybody has at home. Um, if you don't have any of these items, please contact me uh, and we'll try to come up with an alternative for you. Uh, but essentially what we're going to do is mimic the reaction we're doing in lab using an egg um, and using different sources of sugars and different types of sugars to see how it's influenced by um, or how Meyer Brownie is influenced by those different sources of sugar. And um, we'll have a more detailed handout available on Canvas. Uh, again, contact me if you have questions regarding that, and that'll be due um, at the same time as your lab report. So make sure you treat this like a lab activity, that you're taking notes as you would during lab. Uh, we ask that you take a high quality photo of your results. So most people's phone cameras should be good enough to take a high quality photo. We just want to be able to see the differences in browning um, in your experiment. I did this at home and found that uh, I have pretty yellow lighting in my house, so you might want to go with natural lighting by a window. Um, or if you have a white light, that'd be best to take your photos so that you can actually see those hues of brown. That'll be worth uh, half of a point. And then we provided you with three corresponding discussion questions um, with that activity. So answer those in pretty good detail. Uh, and those are worth half a point each. So that'll give you a total of two bonus points. But again, this is an optional activity. Um, and if you have any difficulties completing this or you don't have any of the resources, uh, we don't necessarily want you to go out to the store because uh, we want to maintain the social isolation. Um, so just contact us and we'll see if we can come up with an alternative with something you do have at home. And like I said, do at the same time as your lab report um, and just contact me with any questions. Dr. Hopper has created some groups on Canvas uh, for you to complete your pre and post lab discussion questions in groups. Um, so be sure to consider what we've talked about in this introduction and then what you see in the lab uh, to answer those questions with your group and be sure to include your answers in your lab reports. Uh, now we're going to get into the lab, so I'll be narrating over the lab as I go. Everything's a little bit sped up, so you don't have to sit and watch me do the lab for three hours, um, but feel free to re-watch it and uh, catch any parts that you maybe missed the first time around. Our first step in the lab is to prepare all of our sample tubes. So we're going to label three uh, for each of our different treatments. We have C for our control, our three different reps. Then we have um, samples for 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10% glucose. And those will be um, labeled appropriately with 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10%. Each of these different tubes contains 200 plus or minus 10 milligrams of egg white powder, and that'll be the source of our uh, amine groups in this lab. Our next step is to add 9 mils of all our solutions to our egg white powders. So we're going to use 9 mils of distilled water for our control. Uh, and then 9 mils of each of the prepared glucose solutions, so the 1 through 10% glucose solutions. Um, and note that those are weight for volume, so a 1% glucose solution would be 1 gram of glucose powder um, for every 100 mils of water. And then we're filling up 3 replicates for each different concentration. Then after we put in all our solutions, we're going to cap 
each of our individual samples before we move on to the next step. Our next step is to vortex each of these solutions for 30 seconds. This is sped up, obviously. Uh, and we're going to want to do this randomly, so we'll pick up three different random solutions from our uh, samples so that uh, if there's any variation of our mixing, we're not going to carry that over sample to sample. Next, we're going to measure the pHs of each of these solutions. Um, I know it's sped up, but you can see that these are slightly basic. They're slightly above neutral, um, which is kind of unique for foods in general. There's not many foods that are above neutral in their concentration. Many foods that we deal with are acidic. After we've measured our pH, um, we're going to move on to boiling our samples. So we're going to partially unscrew these caps. We're going to monitor the temperature of our boiling water bath over time. So once this gets to a boil, you'll see here, we're going to add in all of our solutions. And then we're going to boil these for an hour. Um, and this is where the Maillard reaction should be happening. So you want to think about um, how you expect these different samples to um, develop color in this Maillard reaction as they're heated over this hour. After our samples finish boiling, we remove them from the heat uh, and place them into a prepared ice bucket. Uh, we're going to let these samples cool down until they reach 5 degrees Celsius, and we're going to record that time. You'll find that time in the Excel spreadsheet. So like I said, after um, we've waited until these have cooled down, we're going to check the temperature with the thermometer and confirm that they have cooled down to 5 degrees Celsius, which you're able to see here in the video. We're going to recap the samples and put them into our um, sample holder, and then we'll bring them upstairs to centrifuge them. Okay, once we load them into our centrifuge, we're going to re uh, spin them down at 4,000 RPM for 10 minutes, which you can see here. The reason we're doing this is to separate any of the uh, denatured protein that's in solution from our solution so that we can just get uh, a transparent um, water solution or glucose solution with the brown uh, pigments in it that we can measure instead of measuring the turbidity of a denatured sample. And then finally, we're going to measure the absorbance at 420 nanometers of all 18 of our samples, and we'll record that in our lab notebook. And you can find all of this data on Canvas uh, under this lab module in the Excel spreadsheet.